Welcome to the Once in Future Authors Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and I'm so delighted today to be joined by author Joanne Rock. Joanne is the author of, oh my gosh, dozens and dozens and dozens of romance books. She's a USA Today bestselling author, and uh, she's one of my faves. I got to read her on a plane recently. We were just chatting about that. I, I had to hush the person next to me because I was really into it. So welcome, Joanne. Thanks for Thank joining you. me. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Absolutely. And yes, you accompanied me from Dallas to New York. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I could be there. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit how you got your start and why romance? Um, how I got my start. I, you know, I started a career in public relations and then realized what I really wanted to do. My secret love had always been books. I wanted to be an English major, but I had thought, no, you must do something practical and, and got a communications degree. But after I worked in the field for a while, I thought, but I really, really just want to be in a book. Um, you know, how can you do that? And then I, I went back to school. I got my master's in literature. And I thought, well, I can always teach books because that would make me happy, love books. And I did that for a while. But the whole time, I also started writing. Um, and I, on a flight, picked up a book <laughs> that... Um, I couldn't put down, and actually I say it was on a flight. I picked up a book in the airport, Elizabeth Lowell, um, and it was a medieval historical, and my flight was delayed, and I was sitting in Newark, and I was so happy it was delayed because that meant I had a you know great spot to read. I didn't have to move. I could just keep on reading. I didn't care. It got delayed hours and hours and hours, and I was just lost in medieval Scotland the whole time, and I had thought at that time, boy, to give that gift to somebody to completely transport them where they don't care, like the surroundings, the world just falls away and you are somewhere else is a really special kind of magic. And I've worked my whole career in the hope of writing a book that will do that now and again for somebody else, um, because I, I think that's an amazing experience that authors have the power to give. So I, I was working on teaching, um, you know, teaching books that I loved. And I was always writing books on the side. And once I started writing one, uh, it became addictive. It's much harder than it looks. Uh, you know, I thought, I'm going to go write a book. I love books. How hard could it be? Uh, very naively. And, um, and I started to write one. And I, it, it was hard to even write a page. You know, where do I start? I have so much to say. It, it became this quest. Um, and the first one was awful. And, and I knew, you know, midway through, but I wanted to slog through to get to the end to figure out like all the mechanics of it. It was just kind of a learning experience, but I couldn't wait. By the time I got to the end of that first bad one, I knew all these things that I was going to fix in the next one. So I started again, you know, do it again. I have to start with action is what I learned. So I, I started with a really active scene um, and you just learn and learn and learn and apply what you learn with each manuscript to the next one until I got one that I thought, you know, finally, I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> um, I'm writing books, and, and they were becoming better. Uh, but it really, it, it was just kind of an obsessive uh, pursuit. Once I got involved with it, I just loved it so much. And I, I had finally succeeded in crawling inside a book like I always awesome. wanted. To. <laughs> awesome. I love the vision of almost I was I was picturing you learning to ride a bicycle. Yes. And, and you did it and you stunk and, and you did it again and yep. you stunk and you, and you just kept doing it. And I think that's such a gift for you to say to all of our listeners out there. You know, they say 90% of the people in the world want to write a book. And, you know, it's so freeing, honestly, to hear that here you are, you're a successful author and your first one was terrible. You know, we need to hear that. Yes, <laughs> it, it was, and just so hard. And I remember, you know, calling all my friends, anybody that would listen to me, because when you're sort of obsessed with somebody, something, you want to talk about it all the time. And, you know, I'd call my brother, I'm working on this book. And I just, it's so hard. I, you know, you, when you read a book and they weave in backstory, <clears throat> it's so seamless, but to actually do it, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't figure it out. There seemed no good way to layer it in subtly the way that I had seen authors do it and read good authors, how they did it. Uh, but it's so hard to put those things in practice and you really just need to kind of get in the muck and, and do a messy job and, and see what doesn't work. Um, for me, that, that's how I learned. You know, some people are much more maybe cerebral and can think it through and plan it and read, 
read books on how to, but I could read how to books all day until I kind of got in and, and made my own mistakes and felt more comfortable with my voice. Um, I just needed to work through it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so awesome to know that, you know, for one thing, don't expect your first book to be great guys. You know, like right. that, you know, I think a lot of times people do, they have a really high bar for that first book and they think, oh my gosh, I wrote a book. It's going to be a bestseller. And no, it's your first time and that's okay. You know, the first time I ever, you know, made tiramisu was just awful. It was like the fourth time before it was even edible. You know, you have to, you have to do things like that proverbial riding a bike kind yeah. of. Uh, you said something very interesting before about learning to start in action. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And I say that myself so many times to authors. So I'm so, I'm so thrilled that you said it because it's like, you see, I wasn't lying. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that means so that others will understand it, please. Well, am I, okay, I'll tell you first why I knew it was wrong. In my, in my first book, or what I was doing wrong, in my first book, I had the heroine thinking about all her problems and all that she had going on, which was my terrible way of putting backstory in as she thought through all of her all her issues so that I was preparing the reader for all the things they absolutely had to know. Mm -hmm. And it felt clunky and it read clunky. It was clunky. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but I needed to get it out on paper. And later I learned, you know, writer friends say you know, as an, as a new author, sometimes, you know, write the first three chapters, but then throw them away. That was just so you could figure things out. Now start your book. Um, and then a lot of times the book will start after that. Yes. And I, once I did it, I could see where that was absolutely true. Um, so, you know, the next book I started now, keep in mind, I, because I was the big fan of Elizabeth Lowell's medieval historicals, I started in, in medieval historicals. So I wrote a, a Scots story where the hero was a, a Highlander come to um, invade a English heroine's keep. And he's at the door with a battering ram. I mean, it, it starts with a battering ram at the door <laughs> because I really, I wanted action. And that, that's what I chose, that that was going to be pretty dramatic. And it was. Um, and and that, was, that was a better way to go about things and then figure out how, how to layer in things from there. But readers want to get hooked on the story. They don't care about the problems. They want to get hooked right away in some kind of intriguing scene, problem, they don't want to hear somebody thinking about their problems. They want to see the crisis in action. Um, you know, and, and there are other ways to start stories, of course, quieter ways. Um, but because I knew it needs to be action, I thought about that in very literal terms. Um, and and that, that helped me think about how to open a book with a more um, dramatic, yeah. in a more dramatic way. Absolutely. You said something so brilliant just now, which is, and, and I, now that you've said it, I realize I've done this to people. I've thrown away the first five chapters of their book. Yes. I said, this is great. We're going to start right here. Yes. And, and for, for others to hear that, you know, maybe just it starts here. Yes. It doesn't start here. <clears throat> and I've made the allusion to a movie. If you go to watch a movie, it generally does not start with, you know, 15 minutes of introduction to who this person is and what all their problems are. They start when something happens. Yes. Very often, even like in an action thriller movie, I mean, it drops you in in the first five minutes of the movie. Blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what's going on. <clears throat> but yeah. now you're like you said, now right. you're hooked. Yes. Well, picture every James Bond opening ever. You know, we don't know what he's up to, but he's in some dire predicament and, you know, you're your blood level is, is raised, your, your heart rate is raised, that's what it is. Um, by the time it gets to the opening song and we see mm -hmm. James Bond and then it, it turns quieter, um, that's, exactly, that's exactly the method. Fantastic. Um, now, wh when did you go from medieval to you know, contemporary romance? That's a switch. I was having a hard time selling a book, uh, you know, and I'm sure because they were early books was the main <laughs> reason. But I thought, you know, there's a wider audience for contemporary romance than medieval. I thought I will put the odds and game on my side. There, <laughs> therefore, there's more editors reading and buying um, a contemporary manuscript. So maybe I'll try that. And I really, you know, it was probably a better fit for my voice. Um, in historicals, 
take a lot of time and thought. And, and I'd like to think I was putting the time and thought into the story and the research. I love all of that. Um, but I also wanted to write a lot and, and fast because I, you know, I enjoy putting words on paper. So the pace of contemporary romance fit with me that way. Um, you know, my kind of frenetic need to, I love writing. I want to write, 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 write. Uh, to just get a lot on paper all of the time. Um, so, so it did work out really well for me. I was very unsure about it. And my critique partner, um, when I was struggling a little bit, I said, I don't know what to do for a contemporary story. And, you know, what are the problems? Because I was used to, in medieval historicals, the, um, you know, the problems were kind of this epic nature, the, the life and death, the wars, the battles, the, the stakes were so high. Even just, you know, a pregnancy was was a huge thing, um, you know, the consequences and the stakes of something like that in a historical are tremendous in a different way, you know, contemporary, it's, it's much different, the, the kinds of stakes are different. Anyway, my critique partner said to me, she said, well, think about if you're looking for conflicts, think about the conflict between you and your husband. And boom, light bulb, you know, huge light bulb, what, <laughs> what woman or man, you know, doesn't know you know, can't articulate immediately all the conflicts that they have in their significant relationship. Yes, we love our significant other, but it's, you know, you know your conflicts. They're the same fights that you have all the time. Um, so when she said that, I thought, oh, yes, I can do that. I can, I'll give those conflicts to my couple, the, you know, the more staid, bookish heroine and the, um, you know, fast paced talking guy. Um, just I, I inserted a lot of our things on them and it was really freeing. And once once I did that, I just needed the device to kind of get me into contemporary voice. And after that, it became very easy. I didn't think twice about it. It really was a good a good move for me. Um, short, sexy contemporary has been a, a, a great genre for me. Oh, I love the way you chose it. And I, I want so much for our listeners to hear this. You you chose it. You yes. thought about it. You first thought about the fact that you had limited yourself in your market. And, um, you know, I, I have authors who come to me all the time and, and they're, you know, they say there's riches in the niches, but if you niche too far, you know, somebody will come with this, oh, I've got this great idea. Yeah, for what, three people? <laughs> like, right. you know. So I love that you thought about, you know, the marketing, but you also thought about your personality. And I'm really going with that, that you love to write. You wanted to write a lot. You know, people who are writing those epics, I think of Diana Gabaldon, you know, like, okay, they're huge. They take 10 years and she's not, you know, that, that appeals to her personality. You wanted something different. And I'm so glad that you knew yourself well enough and were insightful enough to choose a genre that was going to work with you. I don't think people hear that enough. And I'm so, so glad that you said that. <laughs> That's huge. Uh, you, you called them, you know, short, sexy reads. Now I have to ask you, um, you're a mom. <laughs> and I'm just curious how your kids feel about short sexy reads or do they are they off limits this is a question that actresses often have to ask about did the kids see the movie now I'm asking did the kids read the book you know with Harlequin and I've written a lot of books for Harlequin that's where the majority of my publishing has been done they are so good about marketing what they what kinds of story branding the stories um, that even as young children, they could see the message that they knew this wasn't for them. Um, you know, that, and I have boys, um, I, I, I raised three sons. And for my boys, that kind of, you know, the bright red cover and the clinches, they knew that, you know, that just zero interest in that kind of thing. Um, you know, and they, they never went near my books. <laughs> and as, as adults, they, you know, we'll go by the, the bookshelves, like my, my middle son brought his girlfriend in front of the, the bookshelves and said, hey, here's my mom. She's always here in, in such a nice, sweet, braggy way about me that, you know, my mom always has a book out. Um, but that's, that's kind of his relationship with my, my books is just to sort of show them off that my mom is an author. Right, and right. That's, 
That's the important thing. Does his girlfriend read it and then say, do you know what your mom wrote? (laughs) (laughs) That I don't know. (laughs) Because our kids do get to a point when they get old enough to say, what exactly are you doing? (laughs) I've not been questioned yet. I have the feeling they know. (laughs) (laughs) Glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. So how many books are you up to at this point? I I said dozens and dozens, but... uh... I think I just turned in number 98 with Harlequin. And actually, if you count the books that I've written for other publishers, because I write for Thule as well, and I self-publish some books, I've written over 100. Wow. Um, And I'm not sure all combined, but Harlequin keeps track of how many releases you have with them. And they send you little like milestone flags so that you remember. So I do know off the top of my head that it was um I, I was going to say do they send do you get do you get a watch or something for- <laughs> they do mark um you know like the the 25 year the 10 year you get a little pin um i got a keychain i think for 50 um from tiffany so they do send sweet little uh gifts i, to I, I think a hundred commemorate that like a, a writing retreat and you know right or something i'm gonna mention that to them <laughs> I would be happy to call Harlequin. (laughs) So tell us about your newest release from Harlequin, A Nine Month Temptation. This is, I've been writing for Harlequin's um, desire line. They um, delineate their their books in different series for uh, different readers who want different kinds of things. So there are romantic suspense books. There are what I write, short Um, sexy contemporary and desire is a short um, sexy contemporary line and I was excited to start working with them because they did uh, secret baby stories and I hadn't you know up until that point I'd probably written over 50 books um, close to 70 when I came to desire and I had never done a secret baby story Um, so that was you know kind of new and it's fun when you have something that sort of tickles the the muse a little bit to say, oh, I want to try my hand at this. Oh, or amnesia. I had also never done an amnesia story. And they do amnesia stories there and twins. So just right away, I'm thinking, oh, secret babies and twins and amnesia. I'm going to love this. This is going to keep me busy for a while. Um, so Nine Month Temptation is, a, it's not a secret baby. She tells him right away, but it's a surprise pregnancy uh, story. And it, you know, it was fun for me because it starts off hot. <laughs> because that, the pregnancy has to happen. And, um, you know, they think it's just kind of a one-time thing. So it's sort of a, a romance story backward because the, the consequences happened and now we need to get to know each other and, and figure out, are we going to be able to do this together or not? Um, and, and they approach it very practically thinking, you know, we, we shouldn't even try that. That was, that was a mess. Look what happened. Um, you know, let's just handle this in a more professional kind of way going forward. But then they end up falling in love, of course, because that's the promise of a romance. Um, The promise of a romance. Yes. Live happily ever after. (laughs) We really, we look for that and we count on that. Romance readers count on that. And I cannot tell you how much romance I have read in the during the pandemic, and you know, I really returned to that. And I've read romance always, but um, you know, sometimes when you're writing a lot, you didn't have time to read, but it was so comforting for me to go back to the place where I knew things were going to work out. Um, that's, I really enjoyed romance a lot during that time. I needed those happily ever afters delivered. <laughs> this was going to happen and it, it, it's a safe space. And, and I'm so glad you're saying it as, you know, not only is this the expectation, this is what we count on. And, and you don't say it from a place of that it, you find it confining that the ending is already determined. You actually find it as, of course, this is yes. what our readers want. Our readers, if, if you didn't end with the happily ever after, I, I would presume that your publisher would not accept them. <laughs> I would be crushed. And, and, and I, it's, it's what makes me um, a, a romance author. That is my, my life view is very positive. Um, I believe love triumphs. I want love to triumph. I'm willing to put in the work to make love triumph. And it, you know, in romance, we don't just privilege the relationship between the, the hero and heroine. We also um, 
privileged relationships in general. I work out relationships all the time between estranged sisters and brothers and uh, you know, parents that haven't spoken to their kids, you know, problematic kind of relationships. And sometimes I don't resolve them, but I'm able to give my hero or heroine uh, peace with a troubled relationship to be able to set a boundary or walk away or whatever they need to do. Um, I like that romance gives us a place to talk about relationships, talk about what a healthy relationship is. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that, what, what a healthy relationship should look like. And I think, you know, romance can be kind of aspirational for a younger person as you're looking for what is a good relationship. It can be instructive to see this is what this is what the expectation is. You know, the heroine has been through these difficult relationships and that's what these looked like. Um, you know, the way she was treated. Look now at what she has and what she's demanding for herself. Um, and I, I think that's very helpful to be able to see, no, I shouldn't get treated like this. I should hold out for this. I, um, I, I think those are, are great values. It's, it's great to be able to walk in that world and see this is what a good relationship looks like. This is what I deserve. I, I loved that you, you spoke about some of the themes and tropes in romance, secret baby, amnesia, twins. <laughs> As you're saying, I'm like, I've read that. Yeah, I've read that. <laughs> do, you, do you have a favorite of all of those uh, kinds of storylines? Not really. It, you know, it kind of round robins. I, my favorite is always what I'm writing next. Um, you know, they hold little carrots out for myself to, I just like change, I think. Um, it's fun to bounce around between story ideas to, to keep it kind of fresh. And, and I guess that's what makes every story different because yes, we know the ending. We know that things are going to work out. What is different is the, the journey that the characters take to get there. If it's friends to lovers, enemies to lovers, those are wildly different stories. Um, secret babies and, and amnesia and, and, you know, which might have um, a suspenseful element to it. Those are very, very different stories. There's so much to do within the framework of Happily Ever After. That's such a small facet of, of a story. Absolutely. They always say to new writers to write what you know. Or right. You have a hundred books full of characters that are actually your friends and, and the guy is some facet of your husband. Tell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can, it's, you know, I remember maybe Stephanie Bond, the author, I heard talking about this where, you know, you can write what you know for the first eight books, maybe 10 books. You know, you, you've kind of maxed out your friends, the interesting careers that you know about firsthand. And then you need to start expanding your network. And we're very fortunate with how much is available on the internet that we can research interesting places, interesting careers, um, meet people in those careers too in chat rooms or or say would you be willing to talk to me I'm writing a book about and lots of people say yes that sounds great I'd love to share you know about my career uh with an author and and talk about my work that I find interesting so it's it's also a really interesting way to make connections with other people to to learn about new things and of course I always keep an ear to the ground as I'm traveling and sitting in airports or sitting in restaurants to you know, just be, have my eyes open to life all around me and see what, what conflicts are happening at the, at the table nearby or, or behind me on the airplane, you hear things and that spurs a story. So I, you know, don't just write what I know, um, but I've gotten good at writing romance so that I'm able to tag other people's, you know, lives, situations, jobs for a story now. I'm sure you're super observant when you're outside. Did you ever hear, you know, uh, an engagement happening or a breakup or you're, you're kind of privy to those things and you're saying, hmm, next part. I spend time now um, in, on the Florida Gulf Coast is, is where I live primarily. And I'm close enough to walk on the beach in the evenings. And I can't tell you how many um, evening vow, vow renewals or beach oh. weddings that I find happening at sunset. I have walked through so many wedding crowds and it just seems like such a lucky thing for me as a romance author to have access to that. And, you know, even being kind of barefoot in your beach clothes, you can kind of mingle in with the guests in the back. Yeah. <laughs> and and watch, everybody loves to, to celebrate a, 
bride. And if you're getting married out on the beach, you certainly don't mind some onlookers. So that's kind of fun for me. All right. So Joanne Rock, romance writer and wedding crasher. <laughs> <laughs> and I figure everybody wants to have their story made into a romance novel. I think they do. I think that that's absolutely true. Is there any storyline that you, you know, what haven't you done yet? Is there something you're saying, oh, I really want to do this. I haven't had the opportunity or the, the right story yet. Is there any of those? I have a time travel story that lives deep in my heart. And it's not going to work as a short, sexy contemporary, no matter what I want to do. Um, and that's that is a very kind of niche market. Uh, people who who love time travel. I've always loved time travel in the same way. I'm, I'll be a fan of medieval historicals forever. Um, there's there's lots of interesting things to do with romance settings to put it in. So you know, one day I would like to to put out a time travel series, but um, but not not quite yet. <laughs> well, especially since probably it will be take you as long to write that as you could probably knock out four other books. That right. Yes. <laughs> See, that's uh, that's a tough nut to swallow. Well, and you don't want to disappoint readers to, um, you know, while I'd love to find new readers with a with a time travel kind of series. I also there are readers who count on you for for their stories. They look forward to your stories. And I've. I've fortunate enough to have gotten to a place where I feel like I, I have that audience now for my, for my books and I enjoy delivering things for them that I know my readers will, will love. Great. Best fan interaction you ever had? What would you I think? recently had um, a wonderful friend. I was, had to appear on a, um, like a Zoom show and the uh, host said, you can ask for a super fan to come on Zoom with you. And I thought, oh, who will do that? You, you know, like maybe because you might have to get dressed up or, you, you know, you have to kind of get your equipment working and that could scare off some people or that aren't, that don't do technology. But I thought, well, I'll put the call out there and see if anybody will show up. And I was so delighted to get people that said, yes, Joanne, I would love to do that with you. And um, the, the first woman that raised her hand, I said, that would be great. And she was so thrilled and so wonderful and so, you know, excited to be there. It was really humbling for me to, because I, I worried about that. Who will show? <laughs> wow, super fan. Listen to yes. you. A super fan. That's right. Did you ever write something that afterwards you thought, I didn't know that's what was going to happen. Do you, do you have that experience of not all the time? Oh, yes. I, I will surprise myself with where a story is going. And that's usually when a story is going its absolute best, when it completely surprises you because it's you're not writing the story. It's the characters dictating their story, which is ideal when when the story has become so real, it takes on its, a life of its own. And the, those are the books that write the fastest because you're not at the helm. You just get out of the way of, of the action and the characters. And, you know, you've set something up correctly when it goes that well, that, that things can take those surprising turns. So that's always really exciting. And do your characters talk in your head? Do they keep you up at night? <laughs> I definitely, you know, I set my brain to think about them before I go to sleep because I, oh. I find a lot of my best um, thinking about story comes, you know, in that sort of dream state where then you wake up with the ideas. So I do actively think about my characters. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm thinking about my kids and saying prayers for everyone's good, good well-being in the world too. But also, I frequently will will lock that in right before I, I go to sleep. I find that really helpful to think about the characters because your subconscious does wonderful things for you while you're while you're asleep, something back there is going to work. And, and you know, the workshop opens back, <laughs> back in your brain and will deliver answers for you. Have you had a character who just keeps coming back so they have to reappear in another book because they just won't let you alone? I have a series of girlfriends that I wrote early, very early on in my career, like within the first 10 books. And um, there were six girlfriends. And they, they live on in my head always. I, I've wanted to, you know, I wrote their story when they were in their 20s. And I have wanted to, like, do a reunion <laughs> with them. They owned a, jointly owned a hotel on South Beach. And I've always thought it would be fun to have them sell the hotel to a new group, maybe, that comes in. But just, I really want a chance to revisit those girls because 
they were my buddies. Oh, I love that. I love that they were your buddies. <laughs> we got to do this. <laughs> Let's hang out. <laughs> now, if you were hanging out, where is your ultimate writer's retreat? If you could just go any place and just write your next book, where would you go? Well, right now, in the when Florida has become kind of unbearable, I, I enjoy being there in the winter, but right now I'm sitting in the Adirondacks. And um, I think that this time of year in the summer, the Adirondack Mountain region is a beautiful, beautiful place to go sit and write. Um, it's you know, just the, the temperature and how it cools down at night, warm in the day, but cool at night is perfect. But I, I've always wanted to visit um, like Tahoe kind of area. I think that has some of the same appeal as, as the Adirondacks do, but on a larger scale. Uh, and I, I would like to go out there for a writing retreat too, if the opportunity came my way. Well, I, I will tell Harlequin that you're approaching your hundred. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be an ideal gift. And an ideal gift would be a, a trip to Tahoe so she could write book number 101. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> you have been absolutely amazing. And thank so, you. So much valuable information for our readers and writers out there. Uh, please make sure you find Joanne. Well, you can find her on a bookshelf uh, anywhere near you, um, drugstores, airports, you name it, she's there. But please visit her at joannerock.com. You can sign up for her newsletter and then maybe you too might be one of her super fans on one of her shows. I hope so. <laughs> There's something exciting. Follow her on Instagram and BookBub and you definitely want to get in on that so you can follow her to the next thing. And who knows, it may be a time travel with a whole bunch of girls at a hotel in South Beach. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all mash up and get it all together. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so you much Stephanie. You're welcome. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.